Hi, this is Paul at Focus Pulling. I haven't made a video here in over a year, but this feels like a big enough moment to say, we really are living in an 8K world now. I thought 6K was pushing it when I showed off the newest Blackmagic Pocket in September 2019, but things began to settle into 8K about a year after that. Sharp never delivered on their Micro Four Thirds prototype, but Android phones began shooting 8K video and then this Canon R5 dropped. Dropped is a good word for it because the release got dogged by scarcity, silent recalls. Years ago, some had argued for Sony's overheating 4K cameras. Watching this favorite clip, you can just imagine some Sony executive holding these bloggers at gunpoint off camera or waving dollar bills. We're gonna ask you, Max, on the A6300, was there any overheating? You'll have to talk on the mic, we only brought one. No. Perfect. And uh, did you try that at all the different frame rates? Yes. And there's still no overheating? No. Perfect. There you have it. Then there were other bloggers pontificating that no professional, compared to them, would ever want to run a movie camera for half an hour anyway. So when the R5 couldn't make it past 10 minutes or so, Canon got canceled at the gate. Folks also freaked at the R5's price tag at just under four grand. But fast forward to a couple weeks ago when Sony played their usual long game and got their bought off army behind this new 8K Alpha 1 at almost double the cost of the R5. So I'm dropping this video a little late, but maybe now's the time to take a hard look at the R5 since it's finally shipping and it doesn't overheat any worse than Sony's flagship. By the end of the year, Canon changed how it regulates overheating and the recording times dramatically improved. So in most ways, actually, it's the better camera for half the cost. And in this video, I won't just go down the list of specs to you like some kind of advertisement, but it can hurt to quickly brush up on these features by looking at the camera from this cheap smartphone footage that I shot while sitting down for a break. It looks awful from my Note 10 Plus, but it sets us up to take in the R5's image quality with a clean slate. One of the first things you see that sets the R5 apart is this top panel display. It's a Canon tradition, and it's something that Sony and other cameras skimp on. It helps to have more at-a-glance options. I also really like the placement of the record button and the center press mode button on the dial. The on-off button has a nice, solid, firm click to it that can accidentally go one way or the other. The back panel is what you typically get on Canons. The only thing I hated was the way you have to simultaneously press two distant buttons just to switch into video mode. Something that the Sony 8K camera lacks is a fully articulating screen. This one flips out and can pivot up and down, off to the side, avoiding glare. And while you can leave it pointing backward, you can also face it forward, which might come in handy. People yammer that it's only for Instagrammers who wouldn't buy an 8K camera anyway, but that's a dumb argument because having the additional option doesn't hurt at all. The ports are just as you expect, simple headphone and microphone ports for audio, USB-C and micro HDMI. It's sadly not full sized along with flash photography stuff that I'll never use because it's the 21st century. Yeah. You've got a CF Express slot alongside an SD card slot, the latter and much cheaper of which can handle most of the shooting modes, which I'll get to in a minute. The battery is a clever upgrade to the classic LPE6, adding an NH suffix for more capacity but keeping the same form factor so that you can use older batteries in the R5 too. Just one of these new batteries lasted me this entire day's shoot. One last thing to show you is the sensor inside the RF lens mount. True to Canon tradition, the sensor stays shuttered for protection while the camera's off. This is another great feature that Sony could have easily enabled on their new 8K Alpha 1, but doesn't for mysterious reasons. Maybe they'll want you to buy an Alpha 2 for that as a fake upgrade someday. Now that we've skimmed the camera, we could ask, why bother with 8K? But the density of Manhattan's skyline here answers right back. I shot all these images from the R5 in DCI aspect 8K at 30 frames per second in 10-bit 422 compressed. 
and you can watch and pause at this resolution if you choose it from the gear icon in YouTube. You'll still be watching on a 4K monitor or probably less, but one of the main reasons to shoot 8K is really for latitude and post. This handheld excursion I took, walking from my new downtown studio across the Manhattan Bridge, then back across the Brooklyn Bridge, is a great example why. Without a tripod, I can use the extra resolution to apply stabilization without loss in post. Like Adobe Warp, you'll see me activate in three, two, one, now. I can also adjust my horizon by punching in a little and then rotating. Since it's tough to judge in the field with so many lines of convergence between bridges and shores and skyscrapers. And of course, I can punch in to simulate a closer focal length to begin with, like you'll see from this shot in three, two, one, now. Speaking of focal lengths, this entire shoot used the stock 24 to 105 millimeter continuous f4 RF mount zoom lens which performs surprisingly tack sharp and adds in-lens image stabilization. That's important because it's always better than sensor stabilization, something Sony refuses to admit. And when you combine this lens's stabilization with the R5's best-in-class sensor stabilization, it beats the Sony Alpha cameras by a long shot, or at least a few stops. But there are some things that stabilization can't fix, and one of the big ones is rolling shutter. Since this is a full-frame sensor, that can be a problem. Here's the above-ground subway that shares space on the Manhattan Bridge. I find this result to be significantly better than full-frame Sony Alpha cameras up to the A7S III, and on par with the Blackmagic Pocket's smaller sensor readouts. Another reason Manhattan is a great test subject besides all the colorful street art, is all the moiré patterns from fences and lines and grids that push sensors and compression to the limits. The R5 does have a low-pass filter, and it works. Likewise, the compressed video format holds together well. Speaking of which, I'm using a UHS-2 SD card at a V90 speed rating, which lets me shoot internally on the cheap at the 680 megabits per second bitrate that you're seeing here. Between frames, it's compressed at IPB rather than all I, but I found the difference imperceptible. I didn't have a CF Express card handy, so I didn't test raw format, but I'm saving my raw shoots for my Blackmagic cameras, since B-RAW has game-changing efficiency. Even so, the internal RAW recording capability on the R5 gives it a major leg up over the new Sony Alpha 1, which is limited with severe H.265 compression. And you don't want to add an external recorder that doubles that Sony's weight and cost. All of these specs relate to dynamic range, so our shooting excursion is also an ideal way to test the sensor's limits. There's never a choice but to shoot only in log. <laughs> if we do ignore grumpy old-school videographers, yeah? But Canon has left out its latest generation color profiles, such as C-Log 2 and 3. So here what we're using could be called C-Log 1. I'm turning off the official LUT here in 3, 2, 1, now. So now you see the footage before conversion. It's better than the S-Logs and V-Logs. And when we go back to the footage converted back to Rec. 709, Canon's color space is simply better than Sony's, and we've been living with that fact for a really long time. But using C-Log1 to match the sensor's dynamic range, it's decent but not exceptional. I'm looking into the sun here and getting worried about the shadows. Or I could expose for the shadows here, but I'm losing details in the highlights. Since it's getting dark out, we can start seeing how the R5 performs in lower light. Zoomed all the way in at 105 millimeters, wide open at f4. I like the focus separation in this shot, not to mention character study after looking at all those buildings and bridges. Then, once the sun's fully set, we're getting very low noise at f4, and still obeying always the 180 degree shutter rule at 60 frames per second. 
I'll punch in to magnify the noise at three, two, one. Now. Saying farewell to New York for now, before taking a deep dive into the camera's menus, let's try another location for a few more challenges. This occasion is one of the few film festivals that happened, despite the pandemic, in Reading, Pennsylvania, and they screened my short film Facing West outdoors on a baseball stadium jumbotron. Attendance was inevitably spare and spaced apart, but kudos to the Reading Film Fest for forging ahead anyway. I figured I'd take the opportunity to try the R5 in a more run-and-gun documentary style. Like, how's the autofocus? Here's a simple challenge where I'm panning down and letting it hunt for the label text with the f4 aperture wide open. Its dual pixel autofocus is best in class and basically always nailed it. Sometimes you need to rely on the internal mics. So here I've used that with mediocre results, about the same as any other portable camera like this. We thought Metrolise was the best match for her. So and they were very, very uh, easy to have a conversation with. So hey, if you're even still hanging with me at this point in the video, this might be the place where you tune out, but it is a custom of mine when I've done these camera videos to take a dive through the menus. I confess this won't be as deep of a dive as I've done on others, but at least we can skim through them and look at some of the highlights with commentary. First up in the menus is video settings, and that just demonstrates how this hybrid camera is really a video-centric camera. You get the array of resolutions, and I'm flipping back and forth here, but mainly they're 8K, 4K, and Full HD. So the suffix D implies the aspect ratio DCI, and that's a little bit wider and used for formal cinema. The dash U is the aspect ratio for UHD, a standard 4K television set. And then full, full HD is presumably and always is 16 by 9, as it turns out. When it comes to frame rates, you have the array of options that are fairly standard, including 29.97, which is what I always choose for all of my projects. I kind of don't believe in jittery video having adding any vintage value to films, but you sure enough can choose 23.98, which is pretty standard for um, narrative films in particular, but you can nail precise 24 frames if you want, and then there's even an option for 60 frames per second in the 8K mode. Um, the 4K and Full HD modes can up the frame rate even higher, but that is the top limit at, HK, at 8K. I've chosen IPB as the um, compression for inter-frame compression, which means that um, it compresses motion in between frames for more efficiency. I felt like that was the best compromise, and also given the card I was using, that was what was going to work for me. I also, for that matter, didn't choose RAW because I'm saving that, as I mentioned earlier, for Blackmagic RAW, which is much more efficient, more reasonable at 4K resolution. I think it, at 8K, RAW is getting a little obscene. <laughs> but I didn't even notice with IPB um, and with non-RAW that there were any problems in, let's say, in gradients in the sky, the same way I would see with a highly compressed codec on a Sony, for example. So that's the movie recording size options in the menus. I like how it gives you a nice big preview in the gray banner up top and even starts predicting for you with a real-time calculation the total recording time. This is something, again, that other cameras such as the Sony A1 simply don't offer you. Having mentioned high frame rates, though, let's go out of this menu to be able to turn on the high frame rate option, which has its own option that's by default disabled but when I go down to that it gives me a warning and it lets me know that when I do enable it audio is not recorded and I kinda wouldn't want that would I anyways so when I go back to the movie recording size you can see more options so at 4k resolution I can go 120 frames per second all I and that would be a pretty high quality um, full 4k with um, the full um, per frame compression setting. So it's not the first camera to do this, 
but given that it's geared and tooled up for 8K, it has no problem recording at the 120 frames per second frame rate at full 4K UHD quality. The second tab in the camera menu deals with exposure primarily, and exposure compensation is one way to boost or to um, reduce. When in particular you are in auto mode, I'm not here, so these settings aren't relevant because most cinematography has fixed ISO, so it doesn't hunt around, but, and that's why it gives us that warning. But you can narrow down the range that it can hunt in terms of ISO, and they use the word speed on Canon's. Speed is really just ISO for the rest of us. The third tab in the camera settings starts off with white balance. It's just not something that uh, I don't think anybody can benefit from hearing again about the many ways that you can control it from daylight to indoor and blah, blah, blah. So nothing to see there. But Canon Log is something that there's where there's ambiguity um, on this product. It actually doesn't have capability to do C Log 2 or 3, which are the newest generations, which were designed for more dynamic range than this sensor can deliver. View Assist is a great feature where you can get a preview of what it'll look like when you apply the LUT. But when it comes to Cinema EOS Original, that implies the type of gamut, um, but it doesn't specify um, a variation such as C-Log 1 or 2 or 3. So you're stuck with one for now, a apart from being able to do that in RAW mode, which isn't relevant to a lot of people. The next tab deals with lens aberration correction which is something that it can do on the fly using the metadata from connected lenses. There is HDR movie recording capability, but if you're shooting in log, then uh, it's just not something that's relevant because that's a completely different color space. Um, so it's not a preferable setting to use if you're going a f doing a full color grade anyways. Same for time-lapse movie not being relevant given the um, settings that we set earlier for um, the resolution, frame rates that uh, we're using for normal usage. Next tab, it's kind of interesting that there's a movie self-timer besides the normal traditional um, still photography self-timer, so you can do some delayed um, trigger starts. Image stabilizer mode is something that I already have on and would probably leave on all the time. Image stabilizer in terms of the uh, sensor stabilization was already on and so it's asking us the further question whether we want to turn on an additional layer of digital IS. This is not like the, for example, Sony type that records metadata from gyroscopic sensors because that's a non-starter. It would make you grind through the footage and render out a corrected version using Sony's proprietary software before it even gets to the NLE editing program. So this is in camera and bakes it into the footage, but at the same time, I'm leaving it off at either the cropped in somewhat or cropped in enhanced level because it's uh, with the combination already of two layers of sensor and lens stabilization. It just didn't feel necessary. Shutter button function for movies is just another great example of further customization op options I haven't seen on cameras other than this, where while you're in movie mode, compared to the Sony just saying not eligible, <laughs> um, they give you not only one, but two sort of hot key um, possibilities uh, to use that, despite the fact that there's a dedicated red, red dot uh, movie shutter. So I kind of like that as well. Zebra settings, pretty standard stuff here. Um, there's a Zebra 1 and Zebra 2, and you can set the threshold levels for each. Commonly, 70% is set for um, the interview subject, let's say, of human skin tones. You wouldn't want that to peak, but you want to kind of hang out around 70%. 100% would be like bright sunlight and so on. You can actually go Zebra 1 plus 2 and do an overlay of both Zebras on the screen at one time using the sort of diagonal hazard lines going in one direction and the number two lines going in the other direction. So I kind of like that ability to see both thresholds at one time. So great implementation, though it's not the only camera in the world that has that. The next menu setting is an important one, and it's something that was finally clarified after a somewhat rocky launch 
Oh, when you, you know that you're in the world of 4K and now 8K, if you have an overheating control in menus, it didn't used to be there. But now that we have it, what this specifically means is that if you have it on, it actually will um, make the camera sort of like calm down a little bit between operations to contribute less to overheating. So it did result in that extension of the 8K recording time from somewhere around 10 minutes to somewhere around 30 minutes. And this doesn't become a problem in 4K at all at the um, standard 4K bit rates, which can go indefinitely. Moving along to the autofocus options, we kind of jumped ahead, but we'll jump right back because what we first want to do is we want to choose a method and really it breaks down into two major categories and it's really the first one versus the rest. You know, do you want the autofocus to deal with objects and then track them, like literally move around the frame and look for the thing that should be in autofocus? Or do you want to just have a one-size-fits-all strategy for dealing with things that may move around in the frame or stay in the frame? And where do you think it's going to be in the frame? So, I mean, there's nothing, there's no precise way to talk about it in such a sort of glossing over guide like this. But I think it just was probably interesting to at least flip through all of them. You can read the narrative descriptions of what each does in the gray area or the gray banner. But... I always think of these as sort of like, you know, what kind of compromises are you making between limiting focus to a specific target, or in other words, the thing that's supposed to stay in focus, versus letting other things become in focus, but compromising about what your priorities are. When it came to that tracking feature, um, you can identify between people or animals and birds, um, and then is a subcategory of that, whether you want to have the eyes sort of trigger that um, tracking detection. Movie Servo AF is something that once enabled, we'll see on further setting screens next, lets you have a more elegant focus pull. Uh, I kind of like the word focus pull to be sure. Um, and so you don't want, as you would in still photography, when you really want to catch something fast, you wouldn't want to um, hold down the shutter and have it slowly hunt for the right focus. But when you're shooting cinematography, you certainly um, do want to have it be more of an elegant focus pull. So, I mean, meantime, you've seen me kind of poking around and finding that peaking doesn't work with zebra stripes, which confounded me, but it didn't cause a big problem for me anyways. Okay, so here we go with movie servo AF speed. So I left it always on because I didn't want it to be dependent on what type of situation. Like there's no good fast focus pull um, for cinematography. Um, but you can choose the speed, but actually I found that slow is really slow. So even when you're in standard, the fact that you're in the movie servo AF speed category, it's enabled in other words, even at zero, it does a much more elegant focus pull than if you were using it with it enabled, uh, not enabled, and therefore in the sort of snappy, photography-centric, quick autofocus mode. By this point, after having gotten through the camera settings settings and autofocus settings and skipping really playback, which isn't distinguishable on this camera, um, I'm just going to give highlights as we kind of flip through all of the remaining menus. And I note that you can turn airplane mode on. That's actually an energy saver, as it turns out, right? Why not turn off the radios if you don't need them? Also, something to note about GPS, um, it doesn't have internal GPS acquisition. You actually have to tether to an external device for that. This yellow tab goes through a few sort of file management settings. Um, they has to do with um, how it stores things and so on, and some of the interface settings, um, the headphone volume and the ability to customize whether it beeps or not. Um, I like how it distinguishes between the viewfinder and the screen and independently you can control both the brightness and even the color tint of the screen. So as I just go through these settings and skim through them, you know, you, you would certainly spend more time on that if you, if you had the camera in front of you. It just leaves me with the impression that there's a lot more customization on this camera than I've seen on competing cameras like the Sony and especially the simplified Blackmagic types. Um, you can even assign and store custom shooting modes as seen there. The orange tab 
gets you through some really nuanced stuff. And a lot of these things are going to connect with still photography, which wasn't a focus of this video, but the ability to um, actually even restrict shooting modes could have interested me. Um, in other words, how do I um, create a workflow on this device that will do only the things that I want it to do? Um, the control ring is an important feature of the RF lens mount standard. I love it. It's something that E-mount and many others don't have, really none other have. You can actually assign the control ring on all standard RF mount lenses to control, let's say, aperture. So um, having aperture control on a lens is something I've never understood isn't a standard feature. It should be on every single, even, um, you know, electronically controlled lens. And finishing out the menus is just the ability to store your own presets in a nutshell. And that is a wrap. Thanks for watching. Read the description below this video for links to the product and to the website that has most of this information in written form.